So many have asked the same question. What was the greatness of the Nisayan of the Yekedah? After all, if Hashem Yisbarach himself tells you to do something, isn't that different than the type of Nisayan that we face? How would we react if Hashem Yisbarach himself came and told us to do something? The truth is, it's a foolish question. Let's analyze this for a moment. Why should it be different if Hashem Yisbarach himself came and told us to do it, or the Torah tells us to do something, which indeed is really the same thing, and amounts to the same thing. So you can argue that the difference is, Abraham Avinu had clear-cut instructions, and we often are faced in life with situations where the instructions are not so clear, where we think this is the right thing, but how can we be absolutely certain? Granted, it's a much more difficult to sign if you're not sure whether or not it's the right thing, you just feel it's the right thing. But by the same token, there are plenty of situations in life where we know clearly what the right and wrong thing is, and yet we don't do the right thing. Why not? Because it goes against what we really want. The Father of Chalavach used to say over the shame, the Altus in the Vadik. In Lashon Kodesh, Tam means reason, and Tam also means taste. The Altus in the Vadik would say, Nish to drink in Asach Van is the Asach Tam. There are many reasons why not to drink lots of wine. Over the Tam in Van is Shtakis in Alman, but the taste of wine is stronger than any of the other Tam. It's easy to think, well, of course, if a Kaddish Baruch would tell me I'll try to do it, I would do it. I'm not so certain if we were actually tested when push comes to shove, that we would carry it out that way. Because the Yetzirah will always come with another shot. Hashem is Baruch told, Bilam, it's not going to work. Don't go. And yet Bilam says, well, Hashem is Baruch said I shouldn't go and curse, but I could go and not curse. I can go and bless them. I can go and just mention their Chatayim. He had a shot, Bilam. He had a way of rationalizing what Hashem Yisbarach told him and how he can get around it. Don't think that if Hashem Yisbarach told us to do something, the Yetzirah won't be there with a hundred different Tirushim and explanations of why Hashem Yisbarach really means that we shouldn't do it. Okay, so you're going to ask, but that's you, that's me. But not Abraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu was not the type of person if Hashem Yisbarach told him to do something where he would start rationalizing but it's better not to do it that Hashem Yisbarach means this or Hashem Yisbarach means that but Abraham Avinu clear cut instructions were clear cut instructions and therefore how can you compare getting clear cut instructions from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to our Nesiyanis where most often in life we're confused and we're not sure what the right thing to do is I want to tell you something Chazal make it very clear Avram Avinu was just as confused. Avram Avinu was just as lost as we are during our most difficult periods. Avram Avinu overcame the Nisayan. The Sefer Shu Avchem, quoted in the Be'er Moshe from the Urzhev Ereb Zuchem Levracha, brings the shame of the Balshemtev. During a time of the Nisayan, there is no das, there is no understanding. A person can have all the Madragas in the world and all the Ruach HaKadosh. And all the Vatachim. But when he is faced with an Asayan by definition, that means that he loses everything. And for a moment, he may feel very alone. The Elohim Nisa Es Avram. Hashem tested Avram. Elohim Nisa Es Avram. Elohim is Midas Hadin. Even by a Tzaddik, there's what's called Moichen de Gadlis and Moichen de Katnas. There are higher levels and lower periods. Now, mind you, Avram Avinu's lower periods were far and beyond the reach of the highest of our aspirations. But, relative to Avram Avinu, it was Moichem the Kaddish. Thus, it's not Hashem, Nisa Es Avram, rather it's Elikim, Midas Hadin. When Avram Avinu was tested, he did not have the same Madrega of Das, the same level of understanding that he normally was accustomed to. As a matter of the fact that Dermesha explains by definition that's what Nisayan is. The term Nisayan means, besides of the simple meaning that it's a test, but the reason it's a test is because 
during the time of Nisayin, there is siluk hadas. You don't have the confidence you normally have. You don't have the level of amunah, of faith that you normally have. You don't have the darg of the tachin that you may be regularly accustomed to. Suddenly you feel very lost and frightened. A tzaddik can have ruach ha-kaydish, great madregas in ruach ha-kaydish, but it could suddenly disappear. Dabra melech was mispal, the ruach ha-kaydisha al-tikach nimeni, because before the time of Nisayan, all that ruach ha-kaydish disappears. If it didn't, it wouldn't be a Nisayan, obviously. And Sadiqim, by nature, have Nisayanis, as a rule, because if not, it would be hard for them to become Sadiqim. The Medrash says, the Yomir Dinesh Vati, what was this Shvua? Avram Avinu said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, swear to me that you will no longer test me. I had enough tests in my life. Marshall says the Medrash, you can compare this, to a king who married a princess. He had the first son, he divorced her. The second son, he divorced her. The third son, he divorced her. When she had the tenth son, all the children came in. And they said, please don't divorce our mother anymore. Now, this marshal has to be understood. But before understanding the marshal within its own context, let's try to figure out what the comparison is. Where's the analogy over here? What does Aramadinu saying, don't test me, have to do with divorce? And the answer is, the Bermesh explains, that a test, a Nisayan, is a kind of a divorce. Because the das that we're normally accustomed to, whatever our level of Amunah and Betachin is, everyone's level is different, but whatever level it is, is lost. Suddenly there's a free fall. That's the test. The Bardichava, it is said, once promised someone a Yeshua that will have children when the person really wasn't supposed to have children, when the gates of Shemayim were locked. And as an Oynish, they took away all of his madregais for an entire year, according to one version of the story. And the Bardijava later said, what did I do? And they opened up the Siddur and they saw I no longer had the world and the Malachim flying before me the way I usually was accustomed to. I said, Baruch Hashem, now I can dab him, I can have a And he later said when he finally did get his madregais back, it was on a much higher level, because he passed that Messiah. Just like Avram Avinu had an Asayan on his level, that his Madrega of Ruach HaKadosh temporarily had been removed from him, so that he had to have the challenge of that difficult time, we all have to endure tennis youngness, the Ben Moshe explains, at one point in our life. There are going to be times in our life where suddenly we feel lost and we say, what is going on over here? What's happening to me? And our own beliefs become questionable from within us. Don't be frightened. It's a normal sequence of events. This is your Nisayan, your chance to rise above it by stepping over it. And indeed, the Medrash says in the Pasuk, the Yaris and Mokai Mirachach, that he saw the place from the distance. Mokim also means the Rabbi Nishalem. The Medrash says the Yaris and Mokai Mirachach also means that in a certain level, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was distant to Avram Avinu, meaning that he did not have the same level of confidence or level of betachain the same Ruach HaKadosh that he normally had. And that is exactly why the Nisayan of the Akedah is the greatest of Nisayanites, and that is exactly why the Amuna that Avraham Avinu was mashrish into Kalal Yisrael, the ability to withstand Nisayanites in difficult times, stems precisely from the Akedah. Avraham Avinu paved the way. He said, I am continuing forward. I don't understand this, but I'm continuing forward because this is what Hashem Yisrael told me to do. Let me share with you a feeling an incident which, as you can well imagine, I've wondered several times whether or not to reveal this, but, well, I guess it's worth its lesson. I was sitting on a plane to Eretz Yisrael, a long nine and a half hour flight, and of course I had my safer open in front of me, I don't know how much I was using it, but it was there. And next to me was an individual who had the video monitor on, and there was a movie playing on it. Don't worry, mine was blank. All it had was the map and the destination to see how long more the trip is. And of course, had I been more of a pious person, my eyes would have not wandered a couple of inches to my left every once in a while. But then again, not that I'm excusing myself, this is a nine-hour trip, and eyes do tend to wander. And so I caught a glimpse of what was happening without the sound, of course. And I'll tell you why I'm sharing this with you. 
I glanced this movie of a car driving into the Holland Tunnel, crashing into an oil truck, which crashed into another truck, which crashed into the wall, and explosion after explosion. And in this movie, the Holland Tunnel caves in, and everyone drowned, and things are just exploding all over the place. Hardly the kind of movie one wants to see on an airplane, but let's put that aside for now. And of course I look back to my favorite right away, and it begins to bother me. I know it's just a movie, I know it's just fiction, but then again, things like this have happened. Could they happen? And you have this sour feeling in you. Why does the Rabbani Shalom allow for things like this to happen? And again, of course, this never happened, but things like this do happen. And, and Manish never person after person blowing up that way. Of course, there would be three people who would be rescued. But why those three? What about never those scenes of those wonderful families sitting together in a car that were all blown up over here in this tragedy that never occurred? Now, right away, I sort of slapped myself across the face saying, what kind of a shove for that? Besides the fact that the whole thing is ridiculous. But are you questioning the Rabbi Nishalayla because, because of someone's imagination portrayed on a screen? And I sort of felt bad about that for a couple of moments. Where is my level of betachin? Where is my level of amun as the Rabbi Nishalayla? I like to consider myself an Ehrlicher person. But who knows? I was never tested. How can I compare my Amunna, having grown up in a sheltered environment, to the Amunna of my mother who went to concentration camp? Her Amunna is real Amunna. She was tested. Now, as I would soon learn, the way it works on these little monitors is that if the person falls asleep and the movie finishes, the same movie starts again. Why the airline can't put in another movie that's another good question, which we'll leave for a different time. But the fact is, at least that's the way it was on that flight, that after this two-hour movie was finished, it started again. And being that this person was sleeping, so this movie would repeat itself several times before the plane would land in as you throw. And again, I never really looked at it, but every once in a while, you know, turning to see whether the people who were davening Menachol that he won catches a glance, that's not to say that it's wasn't avoidable, but Eschatoya Nimaski. And I noticed something. The second time the car came rolling in to the Howland Tunnel, heading toward that oil truck in the movie, it was like, okay, now I know what has to happen. Some people are going to make it, some people are not going to make it. No, naturally, that's the way it is. I've already seen the script. And I noticed glimpsing by accident at the cars exploding and all the people flying all over the place. No, for Shaitzach, that's what has to happen, for whatever reason. Oh, that person is going to survive. The other person is not going to survive. That's the script. Now, by the third time I watched the cars exploding, it, it didn't faze me at all. Like, there was no Rachmanis at all for all these people that were underneath the Howland Tunnel with the walls and the roof caving in. After all, it was a given. Some people were going to survive, some people weren't. That explosion was going to happen. And I tried to analyze my feelings over here. How come suddenly I had no Rahmanis for these people the second time around? All right, you know the famous cliche of the lady who came to hear Mechir of Yosef the first time, and she cried and cried for Yosef, and the second year she went passionate for Yeshev, and she no longer cried because she said that it's Yosef's fault. He saw what happened last year, why did he go back again? So why didn't I feel any compassion for these people the second time? Am I as foolish as that lady is saying, well, why did they drive into the tunnel a second time if they knew what was going to happen? Obviously, that's not the reason. So, LMI, I came to the conclusion that the first time what startled me was there's no control, there's no boss on this world, things can just happen that way. Cars hit oil trucks, oil trucks tumble over in tunnels, and tunnels blow up, and there's explosion after explosion. Where, where's the Rabbi Yisrael? Isn't he watching over us? How could... How could such a thing just happen? How could someone lose sight of the controls of the world for a moment? But the second time, I knew what was going to happen. It was part of the script. And now, I know this sounds very foolish, but this whole industry, 
works in the person's imagination and on human psychology. The second time I was not phased by what was going to happen because I knew what the script was and that had to happen. I, my eyes, glimpsed at the same thing, cars blowing up, never families ripped apart. But when I saw those families beforehand driving into the tunnel of a mother doing homework with the children, I knew, oh, I know what has to happen over here. They're not supposed to make it. Someone else is supposed to make it. That's the plan. That's the script. And suddenly it occurred to me what the real difference is between the first time I saw the movie and the second time I saw the movie. The second time I saw the movie, I realized it was all part of a plan. No. This was going to happen over here for whatever reason. I know it never happened. But the idea in life, suddenly, we lose everything. One is faced with a trauma. How could this happen? How could my world fall apart on me? How could a Kaddish Baruch do this? And the impression is that someone let go of the control for a moment. That things are happening without a control. Without a hashgacha. And that's what overwhelms us. That's what frightens us. That's what the Nisoyan is. That's the test. But then, when you come to the conclusion that just because I didn't know it was going to happen, that doesn't mean that it happened without a control. It has to happen this way. I'm not even going into the Pasha of command of the Chaman Tava, but of course whatever Kaddish Baruch does is good, and eventually we're going to look back and we're going to see that it's all good. That's true. But you have to get to the point where we're looking back to appreciate that it's all good. The Shast and the Sayan, it's very hard to understand that. But there's a very big difference when you realize that whatever happens on this world is part of a script and it isn't that Chas V'Shalom HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not looking but it just has to happen this way. And every bullet has an address the way Sadiq said during the time of the war. And things aren't happening by chance. It's all following a plan. Then suddenly you look at the greatest explosion and it doesn't save you. No, there's a plan over here. There's a script. That was going to happen. It was Bashar from day one. It was written that way. One person will live. One person was not supposed to live. Now, why the one person was not supposed to live? Of course, that's the Kaddish Baruch Hu's in real life. But the idea that it's a script, and it's not just Hefker, is a very soothing thought. The Chadush Yerim says that during a time of an Isaiah, a person is completely changed to another kind of person. He loses his Pchira, his free choice. He loses his Dveikos to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. During the actual rega of Nisayan, the Chedush Yerim says, Ain Adam Yochel No one can help himself then. He's lost. What's happening? The world is caving in on him. So how come some people survive Nisayan and they become greater, and others are lost in the Nisayan never to come out of it? The answer is, how much preparation was done during good times to be mechazik your lay so that it is ready to withstand the difficult times. If before the Nisayan, the Chedush Yerim says, you worked on enough amuna then your heart can withstand the difficulty, the test. If you didn't do your best during better times to work on your amunah, then you're tackle lost during the time of Messiah. In other words, what the Chedush Yerim is saying, during the time of Messiah, your engines aren't there anymore. But if the momentum is strong enough from before, then you make it to the other side, a far better person. The Aptid of the Chayim Levracha once came to a certain town and there was an issue amongst his attendants as to where he should stay. There were two choices. One possibility, that is one invitation they received, was from a very well-to-do person in the town. The Abderam asked about the demeanor of the person, the attitude of this person. He was very careful as to whom he stayed, as to whom he identified himself with. And he was given to understand that this was from the, well, Yidin that sat at the Mizrach wall, very hush of a person. And although no one spoke Rosh and Hara, but the Aptarov took one look at him and understood that this person needs a lesson in Nivus. His whole way of walking seemed to clearly spell out his arrogance. He would walk with his head very high on the street. His gold handled walking stick would tap loudly on the sidewalk as he made his presence known. He was inviting the Abderov to his fine house. The other choice, the other invitation came from a more simpler person, a very down-to-earth person. 
In terms of his personality, he was exactly the opposite of the first. However, there were rumors about him that in Inyonim of Kiddusha and Holiness, he stumbled. Although it wasn't the past, but still, the person had a problem with his reputation. So these were the two choices. The Apterov picked the second person. And when his Gaboyan sort of protested, but... So the Apterov said, look, you gave me two choices. One person who suffers from Gaiva, the other who suffers or had suffered from Inyanim of Tomo and needs to be taught how to do tshuva. Both have to be taught how to do tshuva. But in terms of where I should stay, does it not say the Allah to Bidracha, that one should follow the ways of a Kaddish Baruch? In regard to a Balgaiva, Kaddish Baruch says, Ain ani v'hu yecholim l'adr ke'echad. I cannot live together with him. In regard to someone who stumbled into Chait, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Ani Hashem, HaShoychen Itam, B'Tayich Tumasam, even within their Tumma. Provided, of course, that the person is regretful and sincere, he wants to do tshuva. But the Balgaiva is definitely not regretful and sincere, because that's the contradiction within itself. If he was, he wouldn't be conceited. And therefore, said the after all, let's not think about what people would do, let's think about what the Divine Shalalim does. And that's why he went to the second person. Now, Avraham Avinu cannot possibly have a more chash of a guest. The Shechina HaGdoshah comes to be Mavakach Elohim, comes to visit him. And Avraham Avinu runs off to fulfill the mitzvah of Achnas Asarach. Thus, Chazal learned from here, God of Achnas Asarach and Yoysim e Kabbalah Pnei HaShechina. Now, let's understand exactly what is difficult about this idea. HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to visit you, and you ask, the Rabbayin Shalaylam, kindly wait, I have to go and fulfill the mitzvah of Achnas Asarchim. Why do we fulfill the mitzvah of Achnas Asarchim? Why do we do any mitzvah? The ultimate purpose is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded us to do so. It's for the honor of Hashem. And that's the whole idea. O Mishpatim, bow you die in Halalukah, the Katskad Ebeset. The Yom Yisraelim don't know how to serve Hashem with Mishpatim. Not to steal, not to murder. Some don't steal, some don't murder because it's wrong. Because civilization cannot exist. Society cannot blossom unless people adhere to laws. But do they not steal as an honor of Hashem? Kalal Yisrael has, however, this madreg. Kral Yisrael fulfills the mitzvah of Kibbut Aviyim not because it's the proper thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Kral Yisrael does not send away the mother bird before we take the egg because it's the humane thing to do. We do so because the Kaddish Baruch Hu told us to do it. We praise Hashem even with the Mishpatim, which makes the question even bigger. If all the mitzvahs, if the purpose, if the objective of all the mitzvahs is to honor Hashem, then how can you possibly rationalize leaving over the Shekhinah and going off to fulfill the mitzvah of Achnas Asarach. The Ben Reisha from the Yerushim of Rebbe Zuchayim Lebracha has a most wondrous thought on this. Chazal are putting the two together over here to explain what Achnas Asarach accomplishes for the human psychic, for the nature of a human being. Achnas Asarach brings a person to Achna, to modesty, to be mevatel himself, to subjugate himself, before HaKadosh Baruch. Hachnas Esarchen is not a means that leads to an end. It is an end within itself, as the Shlach HaKadosh explains. By fulfilling the mitzvah of Hachnas Esarchen, you are emulating what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does all the time. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the greatest Machnas Oira. Who are the guests of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? The three billion or so inhabitants of this planet. We are all guests of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If a Kaddish Baruch Hu would not continue to provide for us, not give us our food, not give us our water, not give us our air, we would cease to exist within a fraction of a fraction of a second. We're all Archim of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. We're all his guests. Now, when a person involves himself in the midst of Achnosis Archim, and he is Oisik in Achnosis Archim, he's emphasizing something. He's emphasizing something to himself. Why am I going so out of my way for this oirach, for this guest? 
because I too am a guest. And the Nehla, he brings Hachnot to his heart. And the Nehla, he begins to understand, look at me. Look at me serving this guest. Why is this guest on the outside and he needs a place to stay or someone to talk to? How come I'm on the inside? I'm the same guest that he is. In a split second, I can lose everything that I have. But the Kaddish Baruch his great kindness, gave me this opportunity to follow in his path. Just like he is a machnes oyuch, I too have the mitzvah now of achnas Now, if you fulfill achnas asarchen properly, with the right attitude, so as a result, you're a better person. You view yourself as a guest on this world. And the more you view yourself as a guest on this world, right there and then simultaneously, you are being the kabul pnei hashchina. Because the more a person lives understanding that each breath is a present from the Kaddish Baruch Hu, then the more he receives a munna in his heart, and the more a Kaddish Baruch Hu associates with him, then the more he is allowing the Shekhinah in to visit him. So you see, God will have not a is a message. HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to visit you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to Avraham Avinu and said, I'm here to be Mavaka Chayliyu. That's one way of being Mekabal Pnei Ashkina. Another way of being Mekabal Pnei Ashkina is to engage in the midst of Achnos Asarch. Now, Kabbalah Pnei Ashkina outright, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to visit you, that's dangerous. Why? Because what if a person has one tiny thought? I must be a special person if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is coming to visit me. And with that thought, even for a split second, you lose the whole Kabbalah Pnei Ashkina. The Shkina departs from you. Shkina and Gaivas don't go together. The split second you think that you're better than someone else, you've lost it. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu coming to visit you is very nice, but also dangerous. Being that we're human beings and we have this flaw of sometimes thinking that we are better than someone else. However, perceiving the Shkina, the Amuna you draw into your heart through the midst of Achnosis Arachim, that is a far less dangerous way of doing it because making someone's bed, bringing him Nagelvass or cooking him a fried egg and doing it a second time when he says he wants it more wet or more dry, that doesn't lead to Gaiva. That leads to Hachna. And the more Hachna, then the more this wonderful cycle goes on and the more you feel the presence of the Shekhinah. Thus, Chazal say, God will Hachna Sesorich and Yosef make a balas in the we're not saying goodbye, Hakadosh Baruch Hu. I'm going to leave you now. I have something more important to do. I have to go take care of an oivach. Just the opposite. We're saying that through taking care of your guests, you are perceiving, you are inviting, you are entertaining, so to speak, the shechina as a visitor more so than the shechina outright coming to visit you. It's a less dangerous path, and it's because of Ramazina was scared. Such an honor, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself comes to visit him. That this Chas should lead to an iota of his nasus, of thinking that he was someone. Therefore he ran to check it. He ran with the antidote. He ran with Mesiris Nefesh to be mevatel himself through the midst of Achnas He bowed to the ground. Chazal say, he didn't really bow to them, he bowed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But the fact is, they were standing there and he bowed down to them. Does it really help me that in his heart he was thinking of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? The answer is, explains the Ver Moshe, I believe this is what he's saying, that Avram Avinu ran to be Machni himself and say, I'm a nothing, I'm going to honor these people here, these strange people that have passed by. I will bow down to them, I will cook their supper. Because he wanted to retain the Kabbalah of Pnei Ashkin. Because he wanted to quickly quench any possibility of Gaiva, as remote as it would be for Avraham Avinu. And this explains why we have two seemingly contradictory Rashi's, one right after the other, in Pashas Yisrael. With great grandeur and splendor, Yisrael comes, and Klal Yisrael goes out to greet him, led by Moshe Rabbeinu. And they sit down to a Suda. And what does the Pasuk say? How does the Pasuk introduce this Suda? Vayavai Aharon! Where was Moshe? 
Moshe Hagen Hollach asked Rashi. Moshe is the one who went out to greet Yisroel. And because of Moshe Aaron went, and because Aaron went, and the Canaan went, and because Moshe Aaron and the Canaan went, all the Kuala Yisroel went, the whole covet to Yisroel was because of Moshe Rabbeinu. Where was he by this Suda? El Shu. Oimeid um Shamish was named. Moshe Rabbeinu stood here and he was serving. Aaron walks in with Yisroel, they're the official guests, and Moshe Rabbeinu, he, he's serving. He's bringing the food to the table. In the very next Rashi, Rashi explains the words that they all sat down, lift me well again. Mikan zat Rashi, shanehenem isuda shetomida chachamim misubima, kilu nehenem iziva shchina. The Pasi describes, Aaron and Yisrael, there's a Canaan sitting by the suda, as a suda of tomida chachamim, and as a result, it is lift me well again, eating from a suda, together with Talmidah Chachamim is mamish nehen and iziv ha-shechina. You're sitting with the Shechina. You derive a direct pleasure from the shine of the Shechina. So where was my Shrebeinu? If it's so important to sit by a Suda, if it's mamish nehen and iziv ha-shechina, so why did Maisha run off to work in the kitchen? The answer is explained in a seed of Shalom. Once again, we see the same idea. God al hachnasa soisim yoisim make kabbalas pnei hashchina. Yes, sitting by a suda with the greatest tzaddikim of our time, that is mamish nehen and iziv hashchina. But Moshe Rabbeinu chose another route of drawing from the ziv hashchina, standing in the kitchen and serving. That's precisely the point where Rashi puts the two together. Both were zayicha to the same madrega. Moshe Rabbeinu took a different path, however, to it. One that he felt was more safe. The path of Anoth. The path of modesty. That's not Chas Hashem to take away from Aaron. Somebody had to sit down with Yisrael. Someone had to officially walk him in. But we now understand why Moshe went away. Moshe and Aaron were both Isaac in the same mitzvah. Through different means. The Baal Shem Tov's father, before he was like to have the Baal Shem Tov, there was a big discussion in Shemai whether or not he could merit bringing down such an Hashem. The strong argument for his sake was a lifetime of Hachnasus Hashem with great Messiah of Nefesh. Rabbi Eliezer, the father of the Baal Shem Tov, was a great Sabbath. However, it was decided he would have to endure one more test. And that would be the ultimate test of Achnos Yisrochim. So Eliyahu Novi asked, at least let me go and test him. And so he dressed up like a vulgar, abrasive person who came pounding on the door of Rabbi Eliezer, the Boshemta's father, right before Shabbos, demanded food right there and then before he goes to shul, more food and more food and more food. And he was not clean. And I don't have to go through the details, but it was the most difficult Shabbos. And the Boshemta's father endured the test. The same smile, the same cheshik, the same chizuk he showed all the other archim he showed this person throughout the entire Shabbos. And he kept on doing his best to meet his almost impossible demands. And after Shabbos, he let him know that he was a Liyaya Novi, and this was the final Messiah, and he would now be Zaycha to the Boshemta as a son. And this story repeats itself many times by many great Sadiqim. The Babashul Frankfurter. The Kedusha Slavi once passed by this Medish and he said, What tremendous light, what a Shoah Sashrina, whoever learned in this, this Medish? And they told him it was Rav Abishal. He said, Now I understand. He was a good. The Babishal sat under this Medish that explains everything. He was an Ish Kaddish Admiyai. Struggled in his youth with an extremely difficult head. Cried his heart out before Akadish Barthu. He became one of the great Paiskim of the generation. Although he never lost. His humility. He signed all of his chuvas, Avram, who Avram. As if Akadish Baruch Hu changed me, Akadish Baruch Hu gave me a different Neshama, but who am I? The famous story that was said many times he, Erev Pesach, didn't have a place to learn. His wife was cleaning the house. The Shamash was cleaning the shul. So he went to the outside room of the mikveh, and a man came in. Thought he was just a wayfarer who else would sit in the mikveh, Erev Pesach. When the man came out and saw that his walking stick was missing, he accused the Babashul of stealing it. He yelled at him. Later on, when he came to Shul, the first day of Pesach, and the Ramashul was giving a drasha, and there were hundreds of people trying to 
reach over and hear and to see, and he pushed himself over and he saw, oh no, that's the Babashal. He's the one I yelled at. He went running toward him to beg Nasila. When the Babashal saw him coming, he said, I'm telling you, I didn't take your stick. So it said about the Babashal also that a person came to him right before Shabbos. A very difficult looking guest. He invited him in. He demanded a tremendous amount of food. The Babashal gave him all the Shabbos food that was in the house. To the point where when he came to shul Friday night, he said, Rabbi, said, please, an oil came to me right before Shabbos and ate up all my food. I'm happy to give it to him. I'm just scared he's going to ask for more. Can anyone help me out? And it was said afterwards, he was told, you should know, there was a major in the And as many Madragas as he was Zayich to till now, now whole new worlds are going to open before him. And the tales of Tzadikim segment were saying now the story of the Lieber of Bardichev, there were similar stories with him as well. It, it happened many, many times and continues to happen because this is a major test for us. How Kaddish Baruch would give us greatness. We can feel the presence of the Shechina, but there is the danger of us thinking that we must be really good if we feel the presence of the Shechina. I must really be a tzaddik. I must really be better than the person next to me. And once we do that, then we lose more amun and more ashura sashchina than we had to start with. And that's why unless a person refines himself properly, he cannot be zaychut to medregas, to a feeling of hashua hashchina, the chizik that we need, the amuna that we need, eventually the ruach hakaydesh, the siyat ha However, this is the constant test. If the person is willing to run and polish the shoes of another yid, if we endure the test of achnos hasarachim that comes in many different ways, if we're ready to be mevatel ourselves, then we are ready to perceive the presence of the Shechina. When a Kaddish Baruch Hu gave Avraham Avinu the mitzvah of Bris Mila, the Medjish tells us that Avraham Avinu went to consult with his students, Ona, Eshkel, and Mamre, exactly what the best way would be to go about performing this mitzvah. So we most of the explain Avraham's basic question was, should he perform the mitzvah publicly or in private? He was concerned. Concerned that if his enemies heard that he and his household were weak from the Rismila, then they attack. Concerned that people would be worried about listening to Avram Avinu, but hearing his teaching, finding this mitzvah a difficult one to accept. So he asked his students whether they thought it should be public knowledge or not. On their answer, you have to do the Rismila secretly, or else the relatives of the kings whom you slew will hear of it and come to attack you. Eshkol said, you shouldn't do the mitzvah at all. It's a dangerous operation in one's old age. You may lose too much blood. Mamre said, why are you asking questions? Hashem saved you miraculously from the fiery furnace. He saved you from the kings in a supernatural manner. So why should you hesitate to perform the bris milah? Because logic dictates that it will make you vulnerable or that people won't listen to your teachings. Did your survival until now have anything to do with logic? Does it make sense? So Kaddish Baruch Hu told you to do it, go out and do it. What's the question? Your own personal concerns and calculations should have no bearing whatsoever. Now Mamre was rewarded for his answer. Thus our parasha begins, the Yerel of Hashem, the Eloine Mamre. HaKadosh Baruch Hu appeared to Avram Avinu on Mamre's property. And whatever is written in the Torah is written for eternity, it's written forever. That means that there is a sense of a shor, a shechina, that is related to Mamre forever after. Rashi tells us, Mamre is the one who gave Ramavinu the Eitzah Alamila, the advice to perform the mitzvah of Brismil. It's interesting to note the Cheskuni, who was an anical of Rashi, says. Not only Eitzah Alamila means he gave him a piece of wood. Eitzah from the Loshan of Eitz. Mamre had a kind of ground-up piece of wood, a particular kind of wood, that would heal the bris mila. So not only ate the al hamila. That's how the chaskuni learned. Mamre gave the Ramavino this medicine for the bris mila. Whatever the case may be. Honor and Eshko hesitated. Mamre encouraged the Ramavino to perform the mitzvah publicly, and he was zaycha to Ashurat Hashchina for that, or at least the Ashurat Hashchina was in his territory. He had some connection that the others didn't. Dr. Sasem is a myrdik of art. An extremely important lesson in life is not the lesson of life. On the Eshkel and Mamre were listening to the teachings of Avraham Avinu. They went to his lectures. And they said, oh, it's very nice. They love to hear about Amunah. What a novel 
kind of way of looking at the world. They were attracted to it. They became part of the board of trustees of Avraham Avinu's yeshiva. And then suddenly Avraham Avinu comes and he tells them about the mitzvah of Brit Mila. So what happened over here? Amir and Eshkol were a little bit taken aback by this. Because they didn't like the implications of Brit Mila. Until now, they were the Hasha the Talmidim of Avraham Avinu. They were given stature. They were proud of their position. Now Avraham Avinu is coming and he's telling them, it's all very nice, you have a Muna and a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But I am the first Yid, and I'm going to be different. I'm even going to be physically different. There's going to be this mitzvah of bris milah. And as a result, the Ramavina will be zarchet to certain inyanim of Ashura Sashchina that he could have not possibly have attained without it. On there, an Eshko felt a little bit left out. As if to say, oh, now you're going to be different than us. Until now, we had in common that we used to think the same way. We were influenced by your teachings, but now you're standing on a whole different plateau. You're a different Matthias. Your name is changing from Avram to Avraham. Well, they felt a little discriminated against. They felt that they were being left out. And as a result, whether it was through a conscious effort or a subconscious effort, they were trying to discourage Avraham Avinu. Mamre listened to Avraham Avinu's question about how to perform the Brit Mila. And he responded with a completely different feeling. He also understood that until now he was very close with the Ramazino. He was from his Chasha the Talmud. And now that the Ramazino is going to have Bris Mila, it's going to be a whole different Messias. And where is that going to leave him? It's going to leave him much severed from a Ramazino. But by the same token, Mamre's position was if I believe in a Kaddish Baruch my whole point of being a Talmud of a Ramazino is I am now closer to Hashem. And this is what Hashem told him to do. So Hashem told Avraham Avinu that you are now the first Yid and Yidin are going to be different. So fine, I accept that. This is what a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants. And whatever position a Kaddish Baruch Hu has for me in my life, I have my Nesiyayinus. I have my tests. I'm going to be different than Avraham Avinu from here on. But that's fine, said Mamre. I will continue to do the best given my set of circumstances, given who I am and what I'm supposed to do, and I will satisfy the Ratzim Hashem that way. As a result, what happened? Mamre was zoichet to Ashur Sashchina. It was exactly the opposite. Mamre thought, they all thought, that they're going to lose it. Until now, they had a shaykhus of the Kaddish Baruch, and now Avraham Avinu is going to be different than them. They're going to fall away. Mamre was ready to accept that. Because he was ready to accept that, saying, if that's the Ratzon Hashem, it's fine with me. Therefore, Mida connected Mida exactly the opposite. Forever after, Mamre is like to, we read this parsha, the Yehre El of Hashem, Beloi name Mamre. Honor and Eshkel are long forgotten. Why? Because they were slighted. You're not giving us the proper honor, you're not giving us the Mizrach wall. You're going to be different now. Mamre said, I'll serve Hashem in any capacity. It's fine. I'll help you. I'll encourage you. As a result, he becomes closer. Zakta Fasanis, remember this lesson in life. You want a certain position. And the position falls to someone else. And you're upset. You wanted that shear. Someone else got the shear. You wanted that chavrusa. He's learning with someone else. You wanted a certain covet, a certain honor. Someone else got it. So you can look at it two ways. You can say, fine, I'll make my own bismedrish, where I can sit up front. Or you can say, if this is the Ashgacha practice, then I will back that person, I will support that person. If he's the one that's supposed to go up on the pedestal because he is the one who can accomplish, I'm not going to say, well, I was left out, not me, therefore I have nothing to do with you. Just the opposite, I'll say, I'll serve Hashem from the capacity that I'm in. So I'll look up at him and I'll support him because this is what a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants. It's not important whose name is at the top of the letterhead. It is this person who's willing to accept that that is going to be Zachat Tzvashua Sashchim who in the final analysis will be closer to a Kaddish Baruch Hu than anyone else. Look out for this Messiah, says the Svatana. It's a tremendous opportunity. If you have the schuss of helping someone else rise to the top, feeling this is going to be better for the benefit of Cloudy Soul, 
better for the benefit of the Talmudian, despite the fact that I am the odd man out, then it is precisely for this reason you will become the even man in. And while we're on the topic of Nisyainais and their opportunities of either great closeness to Hashem or to fall through the trap door, I want to share with you a mighty thing of art that Joshua brings in the Sefer from the end of Sheva. When a Kaddish Baruch wants to punish someone for doing an Aveir, the Rambam says in the Tirish Mishnayis at the end of the Sechtus Brachas, usually a Kaddish Baruch will give the person an opportunity to stumble into that sin one more time so that the punishment comes right after the sin. The Rambam says this is an Indian Aruch a very elaborate, lengthy concept, the rachuk, amuk, amuk. It is distant from our understanding. It is extremely deep. Who could possibly realize how a Kaddish Baruch Hu works? But, but this is what happens. And the Rambam Tashi, the Pasuk, Eis Laf is Lashem, and it comes time for Hashem to punish. Hefeyot to Hesech, Hashem gives one more opportunity for the person to violate the sin, so it should be clear he sins and then is punished. And Roshwab Kaddish Baruch applies this to what happened in Sadaim. The Anshu Sadaim had made a career. There were generations here of destruction of immoral behavior, of venting particular frustration and pain on any guest who happened to chance by through Sadaim. Yet, when it came time to punish them, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bedavka arranged the situation of the Malachim coming to Sadaim, Loi trying to take them in, and the entire city of Sadaim up in arms. How dare this light taken guests and with this, after attacking the guests, they are destroyed. And this is what the Rambam says. They were given one more opportunity to stumble into the state of attacking Archim just before they would be punished for a whole life of this type of an attitude. What is the meaning of this? The Kaddish Baruch is going to punish someone for the sin that he was like, it's because Baruch who punishes him. Why give him one more opportunity to be nichshal in the chait? Dr. Schwab, you have to understand the tremendous Rahmanis over here that a Kaddish Baruch who gives us. When a Kaddish Baruch who wants to punish a person, when all efforts and all appeals have been exhausted, a Kaddish Baruch who gives him one more chance, one more chance to correct his wrongdoing. And by design, Right before his punishment, he will run into a Nisayan Godel, into perhaps his greatest test, and he will have his greatest chuka, his greatest burning desire to be over the Aveir. Why? Because the hope is, when he will be Nisgaber on the Aveir and fight it off, and push his taiva away, it will create a basis for a last-minute amnesty, for clemency. Like the Rambam says, how does a person do tshuva? The main tshuva is faced with the same Aveira, same person, same place, same Yitzhahara. So he's given one more opportunity to be faced again with the difficulty. And maybe this time you'll pull through. Maybe this time you'll fight it off. Of course, the downside is that if he falls again into the trap of the Yitzhahara and doesn't fight it off when given this one last opportunity, so he pretty much signs his own Zardin. Dr. Shlav Kulevrach, you see from here, Amayr de Gavach. Every person knows where his weaknesses are. Every person knows, Rachman al-Islan, in what particular aspect of his Yiddishkeit he is weak, where his Aveirites are, where he needs a tikkun, where he has to do tshuva and think back about his past deeds. If suddenly one day, a person comes face to face with an Asayim, here is an opportunity to have this Aveirite, the Aveda that so many times he unfortunately longed for and violated. Who knows how many years ago? And suddenly it's there before him. Beware! What may be happening is, this is your last chance to do tshuva. The time has come to be punished, and the Kaddish Baruch has given you one more opportunity to fight it off, to hold back the punishment. The Ansi Sadaim had one last chance. That's where Kaddish Baruch Hu brought the Malachim to the house of light. Had they fought off their Yitzhahara and not bothered them, it would have ripped up their Xandin. And this is what we all have to be concerned about. When we face any Nisayan, is this the Nisayan? And perhaps this is the Indian. That the Pasuk says, 
suddenly they couldn't find the door. HaKadosh Baruch took away their ability to be able to find the door. Where's the door? They couldn't find it. He would think they would get the message. HaKadosh Baruch was saying, don't you understand? I'm trying to turn you away. I'm trying to save you. This is your last chance to do tshuva. I don't want you to find that door. I don't want you to bother the Malachim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I bedavka want to hinder you in such a way you should not be able to be chayte. I want you to come back. I want you to do tshuva. I'll accept you with open arms. You have your whole chayi oil on the bar, your chayi You have your last opportunity. Don't do it. But instead of realizing what clearly was happening, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was trying to protect them and hold them back, being faced with this last thing before their punishment, what do they do? They totally ignore the fact and they continue to try to bang and find the door. Thus says the Sephorna, Rishayim, the Siloines, and Betis, Lesh, Vagahen, and Einam, Chayzrim, Betshuva. The Tzadik says, often, a person has a Cheshik to do an Aveir, whether it's a Geshmak, a piece of Lash and Hara, going someplace where you ought not to go, whatever the case may be, not doing something that he's supposed to do, and something gets in your way, you can't do the Aveir. Understand this is a Shgach Pratis, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to hold you back. Be makir the chesed of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Don't sidestep it and try to go around it and do the chet. Realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying, Stop, I want to help you come back. This is a tremendous chus. Don't squander it. The Sosem and Seyaz, it says about the Anshi Sedaim, they were roim v'chatayim l'ashem yoyd. Rashi tells us, HaYoydim as bayram, they knew who HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. They knew more than we knew. Whom is Chavin Limrit by. And they did a very in spite. Dr. Svathemis, the upshot of this is you always have to understand Mida Taiva's Maruba, Me Mida Saparonis. If the Anshe Sadai knew so much and they were privy to such great secrets of the universe, still, they were determined to go against the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and they were completely uprooted. So us, we who live in tough Shin Sama in these difficult times, we who know so little, we don't know the Rabbi Nishalayla. And, and unlike the Yanshi Sadaim who had it so good, who had such a booming economy and everything was so available and ready before them, we have to struggle. And we have our difficulties and it's and die guys, not knowing. We're exactly the opposite of what they are. They knew they had it good and they rebelled. We don't have it so good we don't know and still we're trying we want to come closer to you we want to do the opposite of rebellion how much more so is Claudia so guaranteed Chayim Nitzchian if their lack of Achnas HaSarchem and attack on Achnas HaSarchem was their undoing then our Mitzvahs of Chesed and Achnas HaSarchem are our guarantee for survival the Pasi says V'yikumu Misham Hu'anashim V'yashkifu Al Pnei Sedaim Rashi says whenever you have the Lashon of by Yashkifu, Kal Hashkafa means an angry stare. There's one exception. Hashkifu, Mimai Kachacha, Mena Shemayim, where the Pasik talks about giving maestras, about giving tzedakah. Over there, it means that a Kaddish will bring bracha after staring. And Chazal say how great is the power of giving matanis to poor people, that even though it's an angry stare, it gets switched over to bracha. The Shinnabarov said, any mitzvah person does. He learns, he davens. If you look at it with very strict glasses, you can always find fault in it. He's doing it for his own covet, for his own honor. It could be undone. There's one exception. The mitzvah of tzedakah. For whatever reason he does the tzedakah or the chesed, even if he's the recipient is still receiving it regardless, the poor person still has his smile, he has his bread, he has his food, he has his tzedakah. Whether the person did it for his own honor or for someone else's honor, or Hashem Shemayim, doesn't make all that much of a difference in terms of the person who's eating. Father of Zahoy used to tell me that a man once complained to the Balatanya that he has a big Achnosis Archim house, but he fears he's not doing it with Hashem Shemayim. And the Balatanya told him, don't worry. The people who are eating are eating with Hashem Shemayim. Zuck the Shinavrav Vashat. On any other mitzvah, you can stare at it in an angry way and say, it's not a real mitzvah, he's not doing it with Hashem Shemayim except for the mitzvah of chesed and tzedakah. Regardless of how tough you steer at his own ambition, but the chesed is there regardless to protect us all and to guarantee our survival.
It's you do have the famous story of the Chassid who wanted to travel to the Baal Shem Tev for Yom Kippur. And anything that could go wrong, did go wrong. His horses kept getting stuck. His wagon kept getting detached from his horses. Any mud on the road he managed to find and get stuck in. Roads that he seemed to be very well acquainted with suddenly became very confusing to him. He kept on making the wrong turn. And after all was said and done, he wound up in a nearby town just about 12 hours away from Nezvish. The people came out and they began to rejoice and dance in the streets. They said, there are nine people over here. A tenth person was supposed to show up for Yom Kippur, but he has not come. Will you stay with us? He told him what he had gone through in order to be by the Boshem Tim, that he could not stay with them. He hadn't gone through all of this just to be able to daven in some little village with nine people who normally don't even have a minion. And so he apologized and left them. He felt very guilty watching their crestfallen faces. They kept on insisting that he had no right to leave, but he said that they had no right to hold him. He finally made it to the Boshem Tim right before this man, and he was surprised. The Boshem Tim gave him a very cold Shalom Aleichem. And he felt that the entire Yom Kippur, the Rebbe seemed... If not angry, dissatisfied with him. Finally, Matsi and Kippur went over to the Rebbe and said, Rebbe, what have I done wrong? And the Rebbe told him that one of the main reasons you were down here in this world was to daven with those nine people on your Kippur, to be the tenth person to be Mashal and Vatminian. Why did you leave? And the Chassid said, but how was I to know that that was the reason I was sent down to this world, to daven with those nine people? And the Boshem says, answered him, it is irrelevant. You had no right to leave nine people alone when you were the tenth one to be Marshall and Dominion. The reality is that that's the reason you came down to this world. But that's not the point. The point is you should have known better than to leave them alone. Has God of Prat created the situation that you were there? Why did you fight it off? Why did you try to be smarter? The Meshach Achman has a fascinating insight. In this week's Pasha, we know that a Kaddish Baruch Hu came to Avram Avinu, Hamachasani me Avram, a Kaddish Baruch Hu said that I cannot conceal from Avram what I'm about to do. I have to let him know about the punishment that will befall Sadaim. I have given Avram the whole land. I have no right to destroy five major cities without his permission. Furthermore, he has to be Mispawel for light, his nephew. And the Anna says there was another reason why Hashem Baruch wished to let Avram know about the punishment of Sadaim, the Medrash tells us. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew that Avram was disturbed by the destruction which the Mabel had brought upon the people of the world. And Avram thought to himself, is it possible that there were absolutely no tzaddikim among them? Now Hashem wished to debate the destruction of Sudan with him to prove to Avram the justice of his punishment. As soon as Avram Avinu heard the news, he prepared himself for tefillah. There must be some tzaddikim among them. Why did you not spare all the cities in their behalf? So the Rabbi Nishlam answered him, If I will find 50 tzaddikim in all the five cities, then all town will be saved on account of them. The Meshachach makes a mayor de Kadiyak. The Lashon of the Pasuk is the Hashem. Im emsa besudayim chamishin tzaddikim besaycheir, which means a minion for each city, Ten for each of the five cities, then the Nisasi Lachal Hamakim Ba'avura. That would be enough to carry everyone else, and there will be no destruction. But then Avram Avinu saw that there were no fifty tzaddikim. So Avram continued to pray, and he said, Anoichi offer the Eifer, I am just dust and ashes, how dare I argue with you? I would have returned to dust had Amrafel slain me in the war. I would have been converted to ashes had Nimrod burnt me in the furnace. I'm only alive because of your great Nachmanis. But a Kaddish Baruch Hu, despite this, let me be so bold as if to ask you, is it possible that there may be five tzaddikim less than 50 in these cities? If there are only 45 tzaddikim, could you not save all cities in their schus? Because then there will be nine tzaddikim in each of the five cities. Ula yachsu in chamishim, ha tzaddikim chamisha, ha sashchis ba chamisha, es kol ha'ir, and the Kaddish Baruch Hu's answer was, I will not destroy them. In If I will find 45 tzaddikim there. Now take note, this second promise is different than the first one. If indeed there would have been 50 tzaddikim, 10 for each town, 
So the Kaddish Baruch Hu says there won't be any punishment at all. Everyone's going to be saved. However, after Avram had to concede that there wasn't 50 tzaddikim, and Avram was negotiating that somehow 45 tzaddikim should save all five towns, so you don't have a minion for each town, so here Kaddish Baruch Hu said, even so, I will save them. However, the promise was only, Loi Ashkes, I won't destroy them. It doesn't say, Zinasasi L'chalamakim Bavura. It doesn't say they won't be punished at all. They will be punished, but they won't be destroyed. Im En Tesham Arboim V'chamish. As the Mepharshim explained, Avram was working all along with the premise that you have to have at least a million. But Avram was saying, well, 45 for the five towns, that means nine tzaddikim per each town, and we can be Messiah, perhaps the Kaddish Baruch Hu, himself, Kaviyahu, for the tenth for each town. But you don't have a minion of mortals. And as a result, the schut is far diminished. And instead of a promise that they won't be punished at all, Avram could only negotiate a promise that Le'ashchus, they won't be destroyed. Le'maisa, it wasn't Nogeya, because he didn't have 45 tzaddikim. So Avram then says, well, can we save at least four towns in the schus of 40 tzaddikim? And here Hashem said, yes. If you have a minion for four of those towns, So once again, it doesn't say Le'ashchus, they won't destroy them. It says Le'ashchus, they won't be punished at all. I will not do any bad to them. Because in the schutz of a minion for each of the four towns, although Avram conceded the fifth town, but if you have a complete minion for the four towns, the schutz is much greater. It will protect them not just from not being destroyed, it will protect them from being punished. But Lamaisi didn't have 40. So Avram was misspelled perhaps 30 for three towns. And once again, the Rabbi Hashem said, for those three towns, if you have a complete minion in those three towns, Loya asset, they won't be punished at all. But you didn't have 30. So Avram tried twice more. He was misspelled if there were 20 tzaddikim to save two towns, and he was misspelled to at least save one town in the schus of 10 tzaddikim. In these last two instances, the Pasuk does say, Loi Ashchis. And the Mepharshim explained over here, the Das of the Canaan, the Balitaisis explains that over here, even if you would have had a minion for two of the towns, or one of the towns, being that it would be a minority of the five, so even a whole minion wouldn't have had that much of a schus, and their protection could have only gone as far as preventing them from being destroyed, but not from being punished. Let's focus, however, says the Meshach and he gives us over here a Mayudika Yisoyed in life, it's not the Yisoyed in life. Let's focus on the difference between the request of save all five towns for 45 tzaddikim to the request of save at least four of the towns in the schus of 40 tzaddikim. In his effort to save all five with 45 tzaddikim, Avram gets a promise only of loyashchus. I won't destroy them, but they're going to be punished. Why? As explained, because you don't have a complete minion for each of the towns. You would only have nine if you tried to save five towns in the schus of 45 tzaddikim. You'd only have nine for each town. Dr. Meshach Chachma, when a Yid has to go through an accounting of his life, we face two things, din and cheshbon. Those are two separate things. Din is the dry facts. Mitzvah goes on the mitzvah side. Avera goes on the avera side of the scale. And then they add it up. How many mitzvahs did the person do? How many averas did the person do? But there is a far more complex investigation into the person's life. That of cheshbon. Cheshbon is much more complicated than din. Because in cheshbon we say, okay, you didn't do the mitzvah. But what would have happened had you done the mitzvah? How many people would have been affected by that? Lutoiv. How many others would have done mitzvahs? You did an Aveira. Fine, you're punished for the Aveira. But as a result of this Aveira, how many others were also over Aveira? Because you did an Aveira in this time and not a mitzvah, how much was lost for Klal Yisrael? There were nine people pleading for you to come in to a minion. You walked away. You were lazy. You were in a rush. People wanted you to join for a chesed project. People wanted you to join for a shia. Whatever the case is. And you refused to join. If other things to do with my time. You may have had a legitimate reason, but suppose you didn't. So there are two issues here. There's the issue of din. You didn't learn at that time. 
You weren't Isaac in the past. So you may have had a legitimate reason. Maybe you have to go home to learn with your children. That's fine. But suppose you didn't. Suppose you were just lazy. Suppose you didn't want to spend the money. So there's an issue of you don't have the schar because you didn't do the mitzvah. That's din. And then there's cheshbin. So din is a person did an avera. Cheshbin is, but instead of that avera, you could have done a mitzvah. Din is a dry accounting of his actions. Cheshbin is the ramifications of what would have been if you'd done the right thing. Another way of putting it, din is, why did you do this? Cheshbin is, how could you have done this? You could have exhausted the same crisis for time for mitzvahs. Why did you waste it? Look how many people were affected by the fact that you decided not to perform the mitzvah or you decided to do an avail when you could have done a mitzvah. And that's why cheshvin is much more complicated than din. You're the tenth person and you didn't come in. So there's din, you didn't daven with a minion. Then there's cheshvin, you could have daven with a minion and all ten would have had Philip at Sieber. And that question comes up in life in a thousand different ways every single day. What would have been had you done it right? Now take the people of Sudan. If there would have been at least a minion in each town, they would have saved everybody. No one would have been punished. Or at least the punishment is going to be deferred. So for five people less, it's so different. Suddenly there was such a drop in the promise from in a saucy, I would be Michael them to, I just won't destroy them. And the answer is it's not just a drop from 50 to 45, one person less per town. It means that in each of these towns, that tenth person who could have been Mashlam Dominion, it means that there were nine people over here that were willing to say, Me Hashem Eli, we're going to be different than Sadai. That tenth person who could have joined them so that you would have had a base of Kedusha, that tenth person said it's not important. I have other things to do with my time. I, because of you, there's not going to be a base of Kedusha. Because of you, there's not going to be an aid of holiness. Because of you, all of Sudan is going to be nothing but hate. That's not my problem. That was their attitude. That's really what happens when you say that there are 45 over here instead of 50. It's not just a drop of five. It's a drop of attitude. It means no one cared that they would have been the tenth person. It didn't concern any of the people of Sudan that they were so close to having a real base Hanedrish, to having a real aid of Kiddusha, and because of me they're not going to have it. That didn't bother anybody. That's why there was such a drop in the promise from Mechila to just, they won't be destroyed. When Avram was negotiating for 40, so Rashi, and most of the Mephashim learn, that means he was negotiating for only four of the tenths. But the Meshach Achma says perhaps when Avram suggested 40, he was negotiating for all five of the tenths. Why then does it go to Loya Esa? I won't punish them at all if you find 40. I mean, if for 45 there's only a promise of Loya Ashkes, how come for 40 there's a greater promise of Loya Esa? I won't punish them at all. Dr. Meshach Achman, he bases this on how the Evan Ezra learns Pshat. Ein Dover Shebe Kedusha Pachas Mea Sarah Bnei Adam. If there are only 40 for all five towns, what does that mean? That means that any individual in this town, had he joined with the Tzadikim, they still would have not had a minion. As a result, their punishment was not as great. The Kitruk was not as much as when there were 45 people leaving nine for each town, so that you had an entire town, the vast majority of the town, saying, I don't care if there are nine, I'm not going to be the tenth. The lack of one tzaddik for each town, when you had 45, was a greater kitrug than the lack of two tzaddikim if you only had 40. Because at least this way, each one said, look, there wouldn't have been a minion anyhow, even if I would have joined. Of course, that's a wrong way to think, but Lamaisa. The fact is, there wouldn't have been a minion anyway. But for 45, where in every town, you had nine people screaming, someone join us, and the entire town, the entire remainder of the town laughed in their faces, that was a greater kitchen. Much worse than if you didn't have nine. 
Dr. Nasser Chachma, we have to take this lesson very seriously in life. After Yom Kippur, if a person doesn't do tshuva, his anish is much greater than not doing tshuva throughout the entire year. Kaddish Baruch Hu says, look, I gave you the opportunity, I gave you an opportunity to be the tenth, to join Klal Yisrael and Mechil and Slicha, how come you didn't take it seriously enough? The Gra says, what's the difference in Din and Cheshbin, quotes the Meshach Achma. Suppose a person comes up, Liachamei of the Esrim Shana, and they say to him, here's Din, you were over in Aveira. But now here's Cheshbin. Why couldn't you do a mitzvah in this time when you did the Aveira? Din says the Gra is on the Aveira that the person did. Cheshbin is on the fact that he could have done a mitzvah in that time. And the way this works explains the Meshach Achma. Is let's say a person was over in Aveira, but he spoke Rosh and Har. So he's punished for the Lashon Hara, and then there's Cheshben. Instead of talking Lashon Hara, why couldn't you say a word of Chizik to your friend? Instead of talking Lashon Hara, why couldn't you make someone laugh? Instead of talking Lashon Hara, why couldn't you daven? Why couldn't you say a to him? Why couldn't you learn that time? Why couldn't you use that same tongue for mitzvah? If a person did an Avera b'maisa, if he physically did an Avera, so there's din for that Avera. And then there's the time of Cheshven. Why couldn't you use those same hands to perform a mitzvah? If the issue is machshav of Aveira, a person was mahara b'chait, and he did not try to control himself, so then the time is, why couldn't you think of Taira in this time? Why couldn't you think of how you can help someone in this time? But here it gets more complicated, because it says, machshav of Taira, kadosh baruch ha A person sits down and he tries to plan out a mitzvah, even if he doesn't get to do it, Hashem considers that mitzvah done. So if a person was thinking about doing an Aveira, so the Cheshvan is very complex, because we say to him, how come you couldn't think of doing a mitzvah in that time, and had you thought of doing a mitzvah, when I see you would have had the mitzvah, even if you didn't do it. So in a sense, the onus of Cheshvan, when it comes to Machshav, is even worse than Maisa. Therefore, Chazal say, Hirure Aveira, thinking about Aveira, Kashin Me Aveira, these are more difficult to deal with even than Aveira itself. Because when it comes to Din, so there's an issue of why did you have this Machshava if you could have controlled yourself, or did you do enough to fight it off? But when it comes to the Cheshvan aspect, it gets more complicated. Because had you thought of a mitzvah in this time that you were thinking of in Aveira, not only would you have the machshav of the mitzvah, you would have the mice of the mitzvah. Because when a yid wants to do a mitzvah, Hashem considers it done even if he didn't get a chance to do it. As a result, it's a dangerous thing to underestimate ourselves, to say we're not going to do something because it probably wouldn't have worked anyhow. Because ultimately we're going to have to face the cheshbon. And the cheshbon is going to demand of us, why didn't you try? Because had you tried, the Kaddish Baruch Hu says, I would have considered it done. Do you ever have grandiose plans or a machshava to really perform a mitzvah right and to do something good and at the end it just doesn't work out? Something got in the way. Another crisis developed. There was a snag. Your overture trying to make shalom with someone was misunderstood and the dispute got even worse and the misunderstanding even more complex. And you think to yourself, well... Next time, I'm not even going to try. Or you begin to wonder, what is it that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has against me? When I want to do something good, it just doesn't work out. It just doesn't happen. Now, the truth is that it could be there is a block over there. A person sometimes is either in a zero or is nichshol in a certain chait, and as a result, he doesn't have the schus to fulfill the mitzvah. The answer to that is not anger or desperation. The answer is to backpedal a little bit and do shuva and be misbowel that the next time, indeed, I should be successful. But we'll leave that track alone for now. The Yisrael Shaka the season, the story of the three malachim that came to Avraham Avinu, a whole different lesson here. The encouragement to a person who tries to do something good and it backfires is not, we'll try again next time. The encouragement is, it's irrelevant whether it worked out or not. It's the planning in your heart that counts and creates the substance and the tangible chutzim that will protect you and push you on to more good things. More than anything else, Abraham Avinu wanted to fulfill the mitzvah of Achnaz Asarchim. Chesed was his life. And Abraham Avinu's Achnaz Asarchim was more than just Achnaz Asarchim. It was a platform for him to be able to be mashpia, a muna into the world, 
to teach the people how to bench, teach them the Yisoidus, the Yiddishkeit, Hakar Tzatayis, Chesed, Tzniyus, and so forth. And when Abraham Avinu was sitting there, withering in pain, his heart was not concentrating on his own physical displeasure. His displeasure came from the Ruchni Yisdika void. Where are the Urchim? Where are the guests? You know, a person only has a certain amount of days down here in this world. And a day that goes by without performing a chesed. How can I fulfill that day? How can I ever fill that void? And with every passing moment, a Ramavinu pleads and begs and hopes. And his eyes scan the horizon. Pleading for someone to come. And to be sheltered in the shade of a Ramavinu tree. And suddenly he sees the three people coming and he is all excited. In reality, these three people are malachim. They're angels. So, maybe you can clear along the Shashayla. Someone performs a chesed to an angel. Is that really included in the mitzvah of Achnaz or Gemilus Chasadet? After all, the angels didn't really need the chesed. They weren't really hot and thirsty. So, the Shark of the Rebbe, when a person does a mitzvah, he creates a malach. That malach is a tangible entity that stands in the person's stead. He demands that the person be rewarded for his mitzvah. Therefore, the Mishnah says, Chal mitzvah, mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah that you create. That malach pushes him to do more mitzvahs. Avraham Avinu's craving for the mitzvah of Achnas Asarachim created these malach. When a yid craves to perform a mitzvah and plans to be in the kind of mitzvah, even if events don't work out his way, and that mitzvah never gets to actually be fulfilled, but the positive entities, the support system, the internal chizuk that becomes part and parcel of the individual's neshama after fulfilling a mitzvah, the malach, the mitzvah malach that is created, is created and is there for him whether or not he actually fulfilled the mitzvah. It is there for even trying. Chosh of Lassi's mitzvah, the nanas, and the person thought about performing a mitzvah, he planned to be in the kind of mitzvah, and some, some uncontrollable thing happened, and Veloy Asa, he never did it. Mawa, all of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, considers it Kilo Asa as if he did do it. In other words, the fringe benefits, the mitzvah, the principle, and all subsequent benefits are applied to him anyway. Assuming that it, he really intended to perform the mitzvah, and it was out of his control. The fact that the Dafka three Malachim came is because the Pasik tells us it was the Yom HaShlishi, it was after three days of Abraham Avinu waiting for Arachim to come. So each day of waiting, and each day where Abraham Avinu did not get frustrated, just said, well, I'll wait again the entire day, each day created its own Malach in its own right. Now, even if you're going to time that performing Hachmas Arachim for Malachim, is not real chesed. But this is the idea. Even though it's not real chesed, wanting to do it creates a messiah as if it was real. Are you going to ask, but the Mephashim tell us that it was the Malach Kavil, it was the Malach Machoil, it was the Malach Hesla who came? They weren't special Malachim that were created by his mitzvahs. It's not a steal. There are many, many different midrashim. There's even a Nedrish that says the three Malachim that came were Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. What does that mean? So the Mephashim explained it means that the Koyach of Chesed, the Koyach of Gevura, the Koyach of Avoida, all of the positive elements of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and their roots, which enable Klal Yisrael to blossom from them, all of these Koyachs were strengthened through Avram, Avinu, Chesed. And the famous Malachim themselves, Gabriel, Mikhail, and Rafael, are strengthened through Klal Yisrael's mitzvahs and our ability to benefit from their benevolence. From Rafael's Kayach of Rafua, from the Malach Mikhail's Kayach of Schus, from Gabriel's Kayach of Ayyash and Rishayim, our ability to be able to draw from that. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives them the power to benefit Klal Yisrael based directly on our mitzvahs. So it's all connected. We may not understand exactly what this means when it comes to angels. But Abraham Avinu's craving created the Kaifas, the powers of Chesed over here, and Rafua, and punishment for Rishai. Okay. So if I really, really tried to perform a mitzvah, and I picked up the phone, and I tried to make a call to someone who 
Lately, I was not talking to, and it backfired. That person resented it or got angry or slammed the phone down or misunderstood what I was trying to say. Let's call that an oinus. And therefore, because the Bible considers it as if I did it, then I'll just have to rethink and try again next time in a better way. But what happens if I plan to perform a mitzvah? And then I chicken out, so to speak. I plan to wake up tomorrow morning early and learn and dive in the way I'm supposed to. And at the end, I never wind up doing that. Or, even if I do get up, my learning that was supposed to be with a tremendous amount of fervor and gishmak and shuva, I was groggy and I was sleepy and maybe a little ill-tempered. And I say to myself, it's not worth it. I tried to do something. It backfired. Who needs it? It was probably more of an avayr than a myth. And you can't say it was an oinus. I was there. I did it. I just didn't do it right. Look, the more of Hold it. That's a my sayyaser to discourage you from trying it again. I'm not saying that you should try it again in the same manner and be a sleepy and groggy and yell at someone because you woke up just a little bit too early, but try again to do it right. Are ah, you going to say, I tried once and it backfired, and I can't even hide under the chazal that, well, an oinus occurred, what oinus was my fault? No, no, says the Marv Shalash. There's another chazal. Machshava taifa HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mitzavah Lamaisa. A good machshava HaKadosh Baruch Hu associates to the actual deed. Machshava Ra ain't a Kadosh Baruch Hu Mitzavah Lamaisa. Do you know what that means? Says the Marv Shamesh, and he says this in his period from the Yom Tev of Rosh Hashanah. A person has all sorts of lofty ideas of how he's going to learn, of how he's going to daven, of how he or she is going to speak to his or her shriger. Whatever the Nassayan is that a person has, I'm going to do it right, regardless of how difficult it is. And then when it comes time to do it, you don't do it right. You make mistakes. Dr. Mother Shamish, if you were really sincere in the planning stages, even though at the end it didn't work out, and you can blame yourself for it not working out because you didn't do it right. Who takes your machshava taiva, your good machshava to mamish do it in, such in a way that would have been a real kiddush Hashem. Or mitzvah to lemaisa, and a kaddish baruch who connects that to the maisa, even though in reality when it came to physically being makayim the mitzvah, it didn't quite work out with all of the lofty aspirations that you had planned for it. And by the same token, let's say someone tells you you're having a guest for Yom Tov, or for Shabbos, and you say, oh no, I'm not in the mood. Or let's say, it's time to dive in, and you say, ugh. And you run into the base of Medrash, and your mind is thinking about a thousand things, and you grab your hat and jacket, and you let your fingers turn the pages of the city, but your heart and mind are nowhere. You really never even intended of you to dive in a good mincha. Your mind is already racing what you're going to do a minute later after your Shemineh is over. And somehow in the middle of the Shemineh somehow the world sort of slowed down around you. And you wound up davening a few good real words of devotion to pure Kavanah. And this guest that you really didn't want, and it's such a pain, and it's so difficult, and it's so ununderstanding, and it's so ungrateful, somehow things worked out, and you passed the test, you passed the Messiah, you really know you performed the mitzvah of Hashem Shemayim and you feel good about it. And then you wonder, uh-oh, it turned out okay, but beforehand I really wasn't planning for it to work out okay. Don't worry, says the Mar V'Shamash. Machshava Ra ain't a Kaddish Baruch HaMetzah the So if the Maisa needs the Machshava to enhance it, the Kaddish Baruch will use the Machshava. If the Maisa was good and the Machshava was distorted, then the Kaddish Baruch leaves the Machshava on the outside. And being that Lemaisa, Achmat Tzachim, can be a very, very trying Messiah. So perhaps it is precisely over here that the Torah teaches us this lesson, as the Shark of the Rebbe explains. That simply by trying, and simply by setting your heart in the right place, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, don't worry, whether it works out or not, the Malachim are there for you anyway. The Panav Yitzharav, the Chaim Lebrach was one of the greatest fundraisers in the world. I mean, he built the Panav Yitzharav out of scratch during an impossible time. When no one in Eretz knew what tomorrow would be, the Germans were at the doorpost. He was oblivious to the whole world. 
He bought the property. He built the building. The part of the Shulam was an amazing person. His whole life. They say that the Tzad Rav Chaim Rachel once said, when they were clearing over here whether or not those that land on the moon will find life on the moon, the Tzad Rav said he has a raya that there's nobody on the moon. Because if there was a Yishuv there, the Panavish Rav would have been there already collecting tzedakah from them. I can't tell you whether that statement was actually ever made, but it gives you an idea of the power that this person had to generate funds for Taira. To make people understand that they were the ones that were benefiting. The Panavish Rav once told someone, people think that I have no busha in me, that I can go over to anyone and ask them for anything. I want to tell you something that it can be in the greatest financial crisis that you should have. And I can have an opportunity to knock at the door of the biggest gavir. You should know when I knock on that door and no one answers, inside me there's a sigh of relief. Shoo. Because when I say when he opens up and I have to make that presentation, it's difficult for me. Stuff goes up, I have to go through the busha, which I gladly do for the sake of Torah and for chesed, but I have to do it. And a certain part of me sort of breathes a sigh of relief that I'm off the hook for now. Even though I need the money. There are different people who come, you know, whether they're guests or whether they are mishalachim or whether they're asking for themselves or for others. There are different natures of people. There are those who simply have no busha. They just knock and say, I'm here. And that has my list. Then there are those who really have a difficulty with that. Sometimes they're forced to do it. They have no choice. And you can tell. You can see when a person comes knocking at your door if he's comfortable or he has to take a deep breath beforehand. And sometimes you have to be very careful because these people are sensitive. They're in a situation that they don't want to be. And if you're a little bit too aggressive or even if you're perceived to be aggressive when you're not, even though he may be the tenth person in the last 20 minutes that's knocking on the door, your rejection can inflict a lot of pain in him. And even if you have to reject, you have to know how to do it. You have to be very careful. And of course the best thing is to accept. To accept his request. It says that Huyayish of Tzatzach from Avinu was sitting at the opening of his tent. That Rashi lyrics to see in Yesh Eivr Veshav if there are any passerbyers, anyone going back and forth. Yechnis in the day says so he can bring them into his house. So the guy, Rebbe Chandracha, once said, Avram Avinu was particularly sensitive to those who were like walking back and forth. In other, words, in other words, he was nice to those people who boldly just came marching in or came knocking up to the door. But when he saw that someone was sensitive and it took a little courage within him to knock, and he's bracing himself and he walks back and walks forth and back and forth and finally knocks. When he saw that kind of an attitude or that kind of really edelkeit or fineness in a person, so Avram Avinu really brought out all of his kachis to make sure that this person feels okay because he saw how uneasy he is to come on to someone else. And he was determined to put that person at ease, to take away the hesitation that was within him that made him take those couple of steps back and forth before he works up the courage to call or knock. Chazal Dashim v'hu Yoshev Pesach Oyo, the Medrash says, Avram Yoshev al Pesach Gehenna. Avram sits by the opening of Gehenna. The Eina Menich Adam the Yisrael Leile Lisaicha. The Imri Emes once asked, the Gemara tells us in the Sech Des Erevin that there are three openings to Gehenna. So, if Avram Avinu sits by the opening of Gehenna to prevent Yisrael Leile Lisaicha, which opening does he sit by? I mean, even if he prevents them from coming in through one door, there are another two. It is said that the Pnei Menachem, as a little child, answered, but father, through the rule, Midatayza, Meruva, Mimidus Paranis. The Midatayza, the good side of things, is always much, much more than the difficult punishment aspect of things. So, so if there is one doorway where people are brought into Gehenna, there has to be at least two doorways to get out. Getting out must be a lot easier than coming in. And therefore, indeed, perhaps the Gemara says there are three pisach, three openings to Gehenim, but two must be exits, and one is an entrance. So a Ramavino sits by the one entrance, and he blocks it. Of course, the question is asked, if a Ramavino blocks everyone from coming in, why is there a need for doors to leave if no one gets in? 
the Gemara says that there are certain Averis or Averis that Ramazinu cannot work with. In other words, he can't block that person from coming into Ghana. But generally speaking, there is an understanding that the more we associate ourselves with the Midas of Ramazinu, the Amuna that we try to yearn for, the Chesed that we try to engage in, so the more we are Zaycha, to reach out to the hand that Abramazinu has extended to all generations, and the more we have a shaykh to the Ramazinu, so that Abramazinu has a greater kayach to step in on our behalf and block the doorway. As we discussed last Pasha, Lech Lecha infuses with us Amuna, Pasha Sayyera infuses with us Chesed, and the two complement each other. The more Amuna, the more we want to do Chesed, because the more we realize we're investing in something that lasts forever. And when we are deficient in our amuna, the more chesed we do, the more that generates the amuna. For in both instances, the Brahma Vina reaches out to us, and the more we engage in amuna and chesed, the more we are extending our hands to receive his. This year is distributed by Kolodas, 11 Stachemet Street, Yerushalayim. For donations, please call 02-538-3999. Fax 02-538-0267. Postbox. Five seven oh three five.